Would you like to start then with uh, telling everybody about um, how you actually got into yoga? <laughs> yeah. It's not the first time you tell this. No. So I started to do yoga in India. I went to India when I was 20. And I really went initially because I, I got really interested in Eastern philosophy. And I've been reading loads of spiritual books and I've been meditating. And I went to look for a guru. And uh, so I was more interested in the philosophy mm. and meditation when I went. Mm. And I started to do uh, Hatha Yoga classes at the ashram in India that I was staying at. And I really started to enjoy doing it. So I was just doing it every night mm. for a year. And then my teacher, who is an American guy, who was studying with Iyengar down the road, and I barely knew who Iyengar was at that time. Um, he was leaving the ashram and going back to America and there was no other yoga teachers around to teach the class. So he went to Osho and he said, what shall I do? There's no other yoga teacher to take the class over. So we won't have yoga anymore. And then Osho said, um, well, who's your best student? So he said, Avidya. Mm. So Osho said, then Vidya has to teach the class. <laughs> so that's how I started to teach. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So after that, I was quite happy to do it. I just jumped in um, fearlessly and started teaching the class. And I think I only knew about, maybe we knew about 24 poses or something. <laughs> and it was kind of more Iyengar style. So I was just teaching the kind of class that my teacher had been teaching there. Mm -hmm. And I was super flexible when I was 20, mm -hmm. so I was really um, good at the yoga that I was doing. So I just started doing that class and I taught that for four years every night in the meditation hall. Oh, wow. And how, how did you develop yourself then, if you, if you only know, knew 24 Well, and It wasn't really until I left mm. and went to America mm. that I started to do you know, a lot more different styles of yoga and have other teachers and so I kind of just stayed with what I knew and then I think I was also, I had a few books like Light on Yoga um. and so I was just kind of learning on my own but I didn't really get to study with any more teachers until I went back to the States in 81 and then I, yeah, started studying more but um, I continued to teach as well since that time. So I always taught, like for me it was more like a hobby for a long time. Yeah. And like when I lived in Bali for eight years, I used to teach in my house every night, a yeah. class, but it was always free. I, I used to do it just as a kind of um, service, I thought. Yes because I had a business and I, I, I mean at that point I don't really think there were many people who were making a living as yoga teachers back then mm. so it had never really occurred to me mm. to try to do it, yes. Yeah. So, and, and so I was making money anyway so I, I thought teaching yoga as a service was a good thing to do. Mm. So I did that for many many years actually right up until about, um, well until I was, so lived in Massachusetts um, when I was living in the ashram in Lennox, I um, started teaching at a yoga studio in um, Great Barrington. Okay. And that was the first time I think I ever got paid for teaching yoga, so it was a long time later. Mm. So that was probably around 1998 or something. Mm -hmm. I started making some money teaching. Okay, so before you tell us more about that, can I ask you, w what was your draw then in terms of yoga? If you were more interested in the Indian philosophy? Um, you know, well, in the physical, to the physical yeah, thing. Yeah, what was actually what drew you to? Well, um, 
actually I studied ballet for eight years when I was a kid. So I, I did that for eight years solidly from like eight to 16. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it very seriously because I thought I wanted to be a ballerina. Mm. So I was going to ballet classes like four or five times a week. Mm. And it was very, it was a real discipline. And so I actually enjoyed that physical discipline. And, um, and I think that's why I had a foundation for, so when I, and I missed that physical discipline because few, for a few years I didn't really do anything. You know, I, I did, I went, I was doing ice skating, but I wasn't very good at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't really find anything that I really liked to do physically. Mm -hmm. But I was really, um, you know, yearning for something physical. So when I found yoga, the first time I did a yoga class, I thought, this is amazing. It's exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. And I think the first moment that I did it, I was, I just completely in love with it. Uh -huh. and, and what was it that grabbed you? Well, just the, I think the physical discipline, you yeah. know, like doing everything, something every day as a practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also the fact that I happen to have a very flexible body. So I think that, yeah, you know, so you're immediately good at yeah, it. Right. And also I'd had a lot of training with the ballet. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, I already. actually had a mind-body connection yeah. already from that. Yeah. Sure. And so it just was a very easy transition. Mm. And uh, yeah, and I've always liked physical discipline actually like to do some physical thing every day mm -hmm. like if I s miss a day I don't feel good in my body mm -hmm. so it's always been very important to me mm. and so I found like yoga was just something you could do anywhere on your own you don't need any anything to do it you don't need any apparatus you just yeah. need your yoga mat <laughs> yeah. actually and um, yeah so it was something you could do anywhere and that I felt really great every time I did it. So, hmm. but also I, I think it was like for me it was interesting because it was never the main event, you know, of hmm. yoga. Because hmm. the main event for me was the was was meditation and the spiritual side of yoga. Hmm. And you know, and exercise is also great. So it was part of the package. But I mean, I originally went to India for the spiritual teachings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still more important to me than the physical practice. But, um, you know, in, in the, in a f they're kind of inseparable to me now. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Because you've been teaching for how long now? 40 years. Mm. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time to have a practice. Mm. And when did you start teaching other people to become teachers? Um, the first time was in was 16 years ago oh, wow. mm. because it was again something what's great about this career is it happened mm. very organically mm -hmm. because I never thought about doing it right. it all just happened very organically mm. I never decided to become a yoga teacher mm. yeah. and I would never have probably become a yoga teacher if Osho it hadn't told me to right. teach sure. and then uh, also didn't decide to te train teachers either but mm. um, basically what happened was a couple of my students asked me to oh, wow. and I said well no I don't really have a training I haven't thought about it I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that why don't you go find something else mm -hmm. and they just said to me no we want to train with you mm -hmm. I was just two of my students mm -hmm. they were very insistent. Um, insistent on it and so I said okay I'll find out what I need to do to do a training and it was right around the time that you know, there were these organizations like Yoga Alliance was pretty new at that time, I think. Mm -hmm. But so I just found out what does the course need to consist of? Yeah. And I started to create a course. Mm. And so I did create a course and they wrote me these amazing references because I had to get all these references yes. and I sent them and and um, and I taught them the first course. It was while I was people. Yeah, oh. at Fox Hollow, actually. Oh, wow. Because, um, yeah, they came and took classes with me at my house. Oh, wow. mm. And um, 
it was not that great at that time. It just took me a long time. You know, it took me, a, not a long time, but it took me quite a few trainings to really feel like, oh, this course is really taking a form that's mm. really good, you know. Yeah. So it just took a lot of um, work mm. and, ex and just experimentation to create the course yep. in the beginning. So I think it took me maybe 10, 12 courses before the course really started to be good yes. and 10, take shape. Yes, was a couple of years. That was a few years, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yep. But it grew really fast. It was amazing. I think, mm. I think I just, it was like catching a wave, mm. you know? Right. When I started to teach trainings, because it was just a, a new thing, really. Mm -hmm. And um, very quickly, a lot of people were looking for yoga teacher trainings. Mm -hmm. And I was really, you know, there weren't that many yoga teacher trainings around at that time. Compared to now, mm. there was really nothing much, sure. yeah. you know. So I just started to do the right thing at the right time, mm. just organically, mm. you know. Yeah. Well. So, what would you say is 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 the main the main thing you want? Uh, the students in your course to take away? Yeah. <coughs> um, and certainly now that you've been teaching for a long time. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I really love for them to go away understanding, you know, what yoga is really all about. Because I think that in the West, it's obviously, obviously very diluted and the kind of, you know, the hmm. underlying philosophy and history of yoga mm -hmm. is mostly not known by people practicing yoga. Yeah. And I really think that if you're going to teach yoga, you really need to know what it is you're teaching. It's not just a physical exercise like aerobics. Yeah. So I just really feel like I want people to leave with a full understanding. You know, obviously, you, you know, yeah. yoga is such a huge thing. So in three weeks, sure. the amount of understanding you're going to get yeah. is qu going to be quite limited. Sure. However, I try to, you know, as much as possible, give people a really in-depth understanding of the philosophy and history of yoga, mm. as well as giving them the tools to be a good yoga teacher. Mm. And, and um, I hope that you know, one of the things that happens is it's actually transformational for the people taking the training because they learn a lot about themselves, about the nature of being a human being. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to share. So, yeah, I mean, one of the main concepts in the teachings of yoga, and this is something that's really written about in the sutras, which is the text that I have the students read, is just that we are, who we are is not this small separate sense of self that we call me or I, that we're so strongly identified with. But who we are is cosmic consciousness. And so the journey in yoga, the path, the yogic path is actually moving from this wrong identification with this illusory separate sense of self to identification with yourself as consciousness itself. So that's a very big concept mm. for somebody that has never studied Eastern philosophy before. Yes. So I think it can be quite, you know, mind shattering. Yes. So I, I, I like to be able to explain that because I feel like that really is the foundation of Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that many times don't expect this at all. They, they think they're going to do yoga, exercise, and then they, uh, they get this kind of a teaching. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think people do get more than they bargain yeah, for. <laughs> okay. But uh, they also get really great yoga asana practice oh, yeah. as well. Because yes. somehow I've actually become a really good yoga asana teacher as well. Yes. And I know that my people love my flows mm. and I've developed my own style of flow. Mm. Um, <coughs> why, why is it important to you to convey that message? 
that uh, we're actually consciousness rather than you know that our identity is consciousness rather than like you said a mistaken identity as being you know a body with thoughts and feelings so why um, is that important? because it's the truth right mm. it's the blue pill, it's the blue pill. <laughs> as in the matrix yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it feels, I feel compelled to share the truth. Mm -hmm. I actually think it makes people's life a lot easier. I know for myself, when I discovered that, mm -hmm. it changed my life in a very positive way. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I stopped being so self-concerned or mm -hmm. worried about myself. And I started to feel liberated by that fact. Mm. So I feel it's a very important thing to know. I don't know if this question is redundant, but the question is, how has yoga played a role in your own spiritual journey? Um. Well, I think that, um, I mean, yoga is just, um, for me, it's, as I said, it's the whole thing. And I think that, you know, you could, you know, there are obviously lots of different philosophies in India, but you can really, you know, the basic message is the same and non-dual teachings. So I don't really separate yoga from the non-dual teachings. I see it as one thing because Predominantly, yoga is a non-dual. It's about the non-dual teaching. Um, even though there was a period of yoga that was dualistic when the sutras are written, but predominantly, yoga is considered to be a non-dual teaching. So I kind of don't really separate that those two things out and think of yoga as being something different than that. So I would say that. Um, yeah, like I said to you, that just the knowledge of the non-dual teachings changed my life. And I think that was something I discovered in my 20s through spiritual experience. And also through reading about it, but I actually had experiences of it. And, um, and I think nothing's ever been the same since for me. But... Um, I just find it's really, what's really great about teaching this to other people is it keeps it alive also for me. It's like I'm constantly reminding myself of it. And um, I think maybe I wouldn't be doing that so much if it wasn't for the fact that I was actually teaching it to other people. So I feel it keeps it very alive and fresh for me. And... Um, you know, also the physical practice, I, th I just look on that as a discipline, like practicing meditation. Yeah. is like something that I do, no matter what, that is my, like, tapas, yeah. you know, that I, I, I need to do it for just strength of character, um, because also it keeps me healthy. I also think it has a very positive effect on your health, mm -hmm. so... Um, you know, there's several reasons that I really like to keep that practice up. But, yeah, I still love it, actually, mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. And I still enjoy teaching it. Mm. And making it enjoyable for other people. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, so... And then, who, who have been your uh, the teachers that have been uh, most influential in your life? Um, well, yoga teachers. Um, well, when I started uh, studying in the States, there were a few teachers that I really um, enjoyed studying with. And firstly was Anna Forrest. I did a lot of workshops with her, and I also did advanced training with her. Mm. And I just found her very impressive. I mean, she has an amazing practice. And um, I also know she, you know, she worked really hard. 
for that. And I also enjoyed her teaching style because it was very much no nonsense. There was nothing new agey about it. So I really enjoyed studying with her for a number of years. And then um, I also did training with Larry Schultz, who was an Ashtanga teacher originally. And I think in a way that was my first vinyasa flow influence because Larry Schultz was doing something he called rocket yoga. And it was really... Um, his own interpretation of Ashtanga Yoga, um, mixing the series up. And that was early on what, where Vinyasa Flow came from, was just people corrupting the Ashtanga sequences. So, um, and then also, um, I studied with Rodney Yi, and I actually really enjoyed his style of teaching as well. He was originally an Ayenga teacher, but he also has developed his own style of flow, which is actually very fast. Mm. But I also really enjoyed studying with him and I did advanced trainings with him too. And another teacher I really loved studying with was Patricia Walden. And she is a senior Iyengar teacher. Mm. And she's um, you know, still teaching Iyengar style yoga. And she's also quite, uh, she's serious and kind of ferocious in the way she teaches, although she's also a very sweet person. Mm. But I really enjoy that no-nonsense style of teaching because I think in America there's a lot of kind of Californian style flow teachers that are really un into this kind of nourishing, soothing, new agey approach to yoga. And I personally don't really like that. So I really look for teachers that are very straight, direct, and um, like I said, no nonsense. In the style of Iyengar, really, himself. <laughs> you know, because I think Iyengar has this kind of ferociousness, but I feel behind it, he's a very, you know, he was a very intelligent, wise man, and his way of teaching was quite strict. And I kind of appreciated that. I prefer it, really, to this um, nurturing thing that people do in yoga. I kind of like the, I like the discipline of it, the spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of like teachers that teach in that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I've studied with many different teachers in the States and there's quite a few teachers that I have enjoyed studying with. Um, David Swenson, I really liked his teaching. And um, Metis Azrati. Um, yeah, I can't really think of hand who else, but um, yeah, I've, I think I haven't really had one particular mentor in terms of the physical practice, um, but just many different teachers. And also with the spiritual practice, even though I've had a, several long-term teachers, I've also feel like some, some other teachers that I've read have also had such a powerful impact on me that I also consider them my teachers. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've had many teachers, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest teacher has just been life itself. Mm -hmm. You know, being alive and actually being alive for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. I think that you, you just learn a lot from the experience yourself. If you're, if you're kind of um, looking for... If you're looking to learn... Mm -hmm. You know, life itself can make you wise. So I think life has been my greatest teacher too. Hmm. Can you give us maybe one example of a teaching that life uh, has given you that's been important to you? Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing in recent years was just because I feel like I have had a lot of spiritual training, you know, which sometimes pays off and sometimes, mm. you know, sometimes you realize then you're in a very challenging situation and you expect that somehow you'll be able to handle it. Mm. And then suddenly you find you're out of your depth. Mm. And I did find myself in a situation like that in recent years, which had to do with relationship with another person, 
um, not a sexual relationship, but just a human relationship. And I was really struggling with it. And I, I felt, you know, like I didn't have the tools to really deal with it, even though I had so much spiritual training. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting. But then I started studying skillful communication. Mm. And I learned a lot just through studying lots of books on non-violent communication. Mm. And I realized that there's also like psychological ways that you can study as well that really help you with being a human being. Because spiritually, you know, no matter how much you know, sometimes, you know, you, you also have to study what, you know, how to, let's say, the psychological ways of, of responding. I don't know how, quite how to put that, but, you know, all my spiritual knowledge didn't practically help me. Yes. And so I feel like, um, but there is practical help out there. So I actually looked for it and found it. Mm -hmm. And it really worked for me. And it was quite enlightening just to see that, I, you know, I, I don't always have the answer, yeah. you know. And I sometimes have to look for help. But there is help out there. Mm. Like there's always someone who's figured out mm -hmm. something, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like as human beings, um, I don't know, there's so much we can offer each other. There's so much we can teach each other. And there's still so much to learn. So, yeah, I think life is constantly humbling. Mm. And I think that having humility is one of the greatest, attributes that anyone can have mm. so that's also one thing I like to teach people is humility mm. I mean to just express how important that is mm -hmm. because I find like for me yeah that's been one of the most important things mm. I feel if someone's humble that's actually the greatest wisdom because mm. It doesn't mean to say we should have low self-esteem. I think we should have self-esteem and self-confidence. Yeah. But we also have to have a lot of humility because mm -hmm. we don't always know. Mm. You know, and it would be a mistake to think that you do. No matter what you've experienced. Yeah. Right. So after all these years of teaching now, teaching experience, um, what can you say was, was like one outstanding moment from your teaching uh, the training? So, what like was it, was there one like amazing event that happened in all those years, or something that really impressed you? <coughs> I don't think. I can't think of one specific thing, but what I do, I mean, what I do find really rewarding is when I feel like, you know, because so often people, you know, thank you, mm -hmm. and you know they really mean it, it's mm -hmm. like they really got what you were trying to teach, mm -hmm. and I feel like whenever I feel that someone, you know, really appreciated what I taught, and they actually, you know, they're seeing what I'm trying to share and it's landed. <laughs> I find that very, very rewarding, you know, because I just feel there's a communication that happens, you know, and that I, get, I know that I gave everything, but I know it was received in exactly the way, with the, the same kind of, um, you know, openness and receptivity that it was given in somehow. When I feel like someone met me, you know, mm -hmm. then I feel really enriched by that, you know, because I feel like I do give everything, you know. I mean, the thing I feel when I teach these trainings is that I'm able to just, you know, give everything I, I know, mm. you know, without reservation. And, yeah, so when I feel that somebody receives that, without reservation mm -hmm. and we meet then that is yeah it's very rewarding and uh, when, 
what, what is the, the, the biggest mistake you've made in <laughs> all those years of training? Biggest mistake? Hmm. <laughs> Mm. I think sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a mistake when you, when I, you know, sometimes you get difficult people coming to trainings mm. or people that have, you know, serious problems, yeah. even though that, you know, I ask about their health and their eating disorders and stuff on the form they fill out. Sometimes people aren't very straight up about that. Yeah. And then when they come to the training, there's been times when I've really tried to help people that have issues. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I'm thinking of somebody that had an eating disorder, for example. Um, instead of sending them home, sometimes I try to help them. Yeah. And I feel like, and then that maybe takes my energy away from what I should be focusing yeah. on. I think I've made mistakes in that direction of um, not actually asking someone to leave soon enough. So it's maybe been disrupting to the training. But I think that now I, I've learned through that, doing that mistake a few times, <laughs> mm. that sometimes if there's somebody that is being disruptive on the training, that maybe it's better to just kindly ask them not to stay and to, you know, return their money and yeah. and not have that person be mm. disruptive or mm. take my energy. So I think that's something I've made mistakes with in the past. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so from just teaching a few people in your own home, how, how did it evolve? How did your teaching evolve to being full-time involved and having a whole center of your own? Right. How did that happen? Well, I was living in the States and this was about 20 years ago and I was living in an ashram in Massachusetts um, in a spiritual community and I was one of the chefs hmm. and I was um, cooking um, full time but then we were having money problems in the community and we decided to lay off some of the paid staff mm. and so I got laid off and I just started to cook three days a week mm. voluntarily and so I had to find a job to make money to survive for the other four days a week and I honestly couldn't think what I wanted to do mm. the only thing I could think of was teach yoga because it was really aside from cooking and um, being a clothing designer those are the only other two careers I'd ever had and I didn't really want to cook in a restaurant situation so and I'd given up on the clothing designing so I just felt like yoga was the only other option so I, I just thought I'm gonna make my living now teaching yoga I just made that decision and so and it was kind of an interesting decision to make because at that time, 20 years ago, yoga was not as popular as it is now. Mm -hmm. And um, we were also living in quite a blue collar town mm. where there really wasn't much yoga. There was mm. one yoga studio in a nearby town. And aside from that, there wasn't much yoga around. So it was a pretty bold thing to think that I was going to make my living teaching yoga. But mm. I just was very... I was very sure about it and so I made a lot of effort to find full-time work. Um, it just took me several weeks really of just really focused effort of just looking for yoga teaching jobs and I was making lots and lots of phone calls and uh, I ended up with um, about 18 classes a week that I kind of created out of nothing really and um, I've always had good manifesting skills so, <laughs> so I was um, able to start making a full-time living teaching yoga and it went actually really really well we were lucky enough to live down the road from the most exclusive health spa in the States which was Canyon Ranch mm -hmm. and I was fortunate enough to get at least a part-time job at Canyon Ranch teaching yoga mm -hmm. and um, yeah and then I Eventually, after a few years of teaching yoga in the area, I um, decided to open my own yoga studio. 
And so I opened a beautiful studio in North Adams, Massachusetts. And that was about 14 years ago now. And um, that studio is still open today. So it was really, that was really awesome to have my own yoga studio and to just create a beautiful space. And also I really enjoyed creating the community around the studio and for helping people network and meet like-minded people. Mm. And it was the first yoga studio in the area mm. there. And yeah, I'm really happy it's still open today and people are still attending. Um, and um, yeah, that, so I was, I think what happened after, I was running the studio for about six years. And then I decided to leave the spiritual community that I've been involved with for a long time. And so I no longer had any reason, I mean, aside from the studio, it wasn't really a strong reason to keep me in that area. Um, because even though Massachusetts is really beautiful in the summer and the fall, a little bit in the springtime, it has a very long winter. Um, and I didn't really like East Coast winters. Um, so I really didn't want to stay on the East Coast. So I decided I wanted to um, just t take the yoga teacher training on the road. And so I started to teach my trainings all around the world in warm countries like Bali and Costa Rica and Thailand and Guatemala and India, Italy, Portugal. I just traveled and did yoga teacher trainings and that went really, really well. Um, so my training started to become super successful and um, and I did that for about five years, just traveled and taught. Didn't really live anywhere specifically. And then came the point where I, um, I just felt like I really needed a home. And I had a few false starts at finding a home. <laughs> but um, I finally decided to, I really wanted to open my own retreat center. And that was when, um, yeah, I said that to Peter Simmons, my friend who was living in London in I and he was working in IT. I just had told him this. And if maybe, I don't know, six months after I told him that, he actually said he'd like to do it with me, which was a big surprise. Mm -hmm. And so I just accepted his offer. And then everything happened really quickly. Um, he started looking for somewhere. Actually, at that point, we decided to look in southern Spain, in Andalusia, because I'd kind of um, just ruled out a few of the other places where I, I like to be, like Bali and Costa Rica, really because the market was flooded there. And um, I felt like in Europe, I hadn't yet found a retreat center that I really, really loved, that was right for me. And so I kind of felt like... I need to create a retreat center in Europe because I just haven't found one that really works for me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make a retreat center that would work for my trainings, really. Mm. Um, and then once I teamed up with Peter, and we also teamed up with you, mm -hmm. and then we quickly, well, we found another place first, yeah. and we tried to get that, but it didn't work out because it was going to cost too much money. Mm -hmm. But then we found this place mm. and it was actually perfect, yeah. right? It was almost like it was waiting for us. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like, yeah, it was just like very, very fortunate mm. that we found this place. And um, I've actually been falling in love with the place more and more every day, you know, since we had it. So, yeah, and we went through a lot. And um, Peter's not working with us anymore. At least he's not living here and working with us. Um, but we've come a long way. We've been doing this for four years now. Almost, yes. Yeah, and it's actually going really, really well. Mm. And um, I actually made, managed to manifest my dream of uh, <laughs> building a huge yoga hall <laughs> that, is gonna, that is totally beautiful. And, um, and we're working towards creating the perfect yoga retreat center, right? <laughs> 
So um, I think it's going well. Mm. What do you think? It's going fantastic. No, no, this place is it's so beautiful. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> yeah, mm. so 